The president of the Chamber of Agriculture, Martin Paul Minjos Momeni, takes office and is exalted to trigger change in the institution and render it a veritable tool for development and economic growth. Barring the way to the coronavirus in public transport sector, a huge battle to win as both commuters and transporters stay indifferent to barrier health prescriptions. A state funeral for a statesman, the late minister delegate to the Minister of External Relations in charge of relations with the Islamic world, Adam Gagum, is interred with the head of state represented by Minister Samuel Vondo Ayolo. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Those were the headlines of the 7.30 News. I urge you once again to put on your face masks, to wash your hands regularly, and to consult a physician or any other health personnel if you notice any symptoms. This is the only way to save lives and to curb the spread of the virus. Back. The president of the Chamber of Agriculture, Fisheries, Livestock and Forestry, Martin Paul Minjos Momeni, has been commissioned into office. He was installed today by the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development, Gabriel Bayrobe, who challenged him to stimulate change in sectors essential to thrust economic development. Iwane Poli reports on the installation ceremony which took place in Yaoundé today. The appointment of Martin Paul Minjos Momeni as the new president of the Chamber of Agriculture, Fisheries, Livestock and Forestry, CAPEF, ushers in a new lease of life to the organ, which is expected to revive farmers' activities across the country and give shape to government's move in boosting agricultural production and reducing perennial importation of food crops. During the official installation ceremony, the Minister of Agriculture and Road Development reiterated the mission of the new birds of the Chamber of Agriculture. Good collaboration with the various institutional partners, members, and economic operators, objectivity and selflessness, the test of performance. In addition, I urge you to maintain a good relationship with the hierarchy, Minagra, and Minfi. Martin Paul Minjos Momini was appointed by a presidential decree on February 24, 2021 as president of CAPEF. The agricultural engineer was until his appointment director of studies, programs and cooperation at Minade. He is replacing Joseph Roland Mata, who died on September 23, 2020. Yes. One of the main missions assigned to the Chamber of Agriculture is defending the interests of actors involved in the production of items that can guarantee food sufficiency in the country. For economists, it is critical that a proper assessment of the realities of each domain is made to adequately respond to their needs. Clarice Aray Takang reports on how the structure can valuably play its role as a development tool. Agriculture, fisheries, livestock and forestry, four sectors which are able to yield economic proceeds when properly managed. That is, however, what experts hold. The involvement of the Chamber of Agriculture, fisheries, livestock and forestry is therefore strategic. The institution's role as middleman between the state and actors in these domains is a crucial one. The problem now is to go to the field. The farmers are in the village. so. We must decentralize our chamber in the region to be near the farmers. No, they are challenged. Money is a tool. There can be no development without the harnessing of skills, talents, know-how and techniques specific to each field and locality. The first thing will be to go to the field and see the work done. The Chamber of Agriculture is expected to do even more. They can organize service to get more information from the real, real information from the field to, to be able to make good decisions. Chamber of Agriculture can enormously contribute in training 
people in the rural world about democracy and governance. Protecting the interests of producers granted, but the contribution of the Chamber of Agriculture to the country's growth is multidimensional, requiring more field work and less talk, economists insist. The effective socio-economic integration of ex-fighters lodged in the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration centers has come under sharp focus today. The forum was the second session of the management board of the disarmament, demobilization and reintegration committee. Prime Minister Joseph John Gute presided over the sitting where strategies for reinstatement and financial opportunities were examined. Christian Cheatam has the details. This second session of the Management Board of the National Disarmament, Demobilization and Reintegration Committee dwelt on strategies to enhance the integration of ex-combatants in the Boya, Bamenda and Mura centers, which together host 651 inmates. Training, the construction of infrastructures and partnerships with other organs were identified as the main strategies applied over the past two years. We've trained them a lot, agriculture, uh, carpentry, livestock. The participation of inmates in public projects is also used as a means of social reinsertion. We have projects in the center which we involve them. Even in the B center under construction, which is already completed in the airport, many of our ex-fighters took part in the construction. Talking on opportunities for the funding of projects of inmates, the Minister of Youth Affairs, Monona Futsu, said different projects like PIFMAS, Pajer U, and the three-year special youth development plan present endless possibilities. Prime Minister Joseph Dionguti said the effective reinsertion of inmates of DDR centers must be a priority. He has called for sustained efforts to ensure that inmates follow the program to a happy end. Under this developing story, 342 Nigerian refugees in the Far North region have effectively returned to their homeland. They are part of the 5,000 who opted for a voluntary repatriation. They were received in the border locality of Amchide in Mayosava Division by the executive governor of Borno State in Nigeria. Ebenezer Akanga reports on the homegoing, supervised by Minister Paul Atanganji, who has rounded up his working visit in the Far North region. The departure of the convoy was officially given on the esplanade of the Far North Governor's Office in Marwa under the supervision of the Minister of Territorial Administration, Paul Atanganji. This first group is made up of 342 refugees from wounded families. The refugees were handed to the Executive Governor of Bornu State of Nigeria by Cameroon's Minister of Territorial Administration at the border locality of Amshidi in Mayu Sava Division. The Minister of Territorial Administration also handed relief packages offered by President Paul Beer to the refugees to enable them to start life back home. And President Paul Beer has instructed us to insist on the voluntary nature of the departure. All those who are going home have willfully accepted to go back to Nigeria. We are so much overwhelmed by the huge donation that we received from the government of Cameroon, specifically from President Paul Bia and his beloved wife. The repatriation process will continue to all the 5,000 refugees who have voluntarily decided to return to their country are taken back home. The Nigerian refugees who are now safely home had spent about eight years at the Minawau refugee camp and benefited from the hospitableness of the Cameroonian government. They applaud actions taken to make certain their reinsertion privileges which the over 4,500 still at the camp at the heart of Mayo Tanaga Division continue to benefit from. Ayok John Ashu has more. Tears of joy spiced with nostalgia at the Minawau refugee camp as the first contingent of about 400 refugees voluntarily leave where they have found temporary home for the past eight years. An emotional moment among people who have had much in common during their sojourn in Minawao, who remain grateful to the Cameroon government and the UN Refugee Agency. Security is here. We talk to Cameroon government very well. Since 2013, we'll be here. After now, we are together. Even here, and Ida Fatnas, angels, 
many people and kings who are our labors in this uh, village, like Gadala, uh, Gawar, Zamai, Sabangari. As the rest of the refugees await their turn to go back to their native Bono state, some profess they have been enticed by the warmth and hospitality of the host community. We have a marriage from them, and then they have a marriage from we. Even me, if I turn back to Nigeria, I will turn back to Cameroon to do my business. Meantime, these men, women and children who have fled from Boko Haram exactions in Nigeria continue to feel at home, though away from home. And this decree to organize a state funeral in honor of Mr. Adam Gagum, the President of the Republic, mindful of the Constitution, mindful of decree number 76 slash 242 of 16 September 1976 to lay down the rules of protocol applicable in public ceremonies, presidents and civil and military honors, hereby decrees as for one, a state funeral shall be organized in honor of Mr. Adam Gagu, Minister Delegate to the Minister of External Relations in charge of cooperation with the Islamic world, who died on the 8th of March 2021 in Yaoundé due to an illness. Article 2, the state funeral shall take place on Tuesday, the 9th of March 2021. Article 3, this decree shall be registered, published according to the procedure of urgency and inserted in the official gazette in the English and French languages. It is signed by the President of the Republic, His Excellency Paul Biya. The state has not bid farewell to the late minister delegate to the Minister of External Relations in charge of relations with the Islamic world, Adam Gagum. President Paul Biya was represented at the state funeral of the member of government who spent 20 years over as minister delegate by the director of the civil cabinet of the presidency, Minister Samuel Vonto Ayolo. Charles Ebonne reports on the coffining, the honours and the burial today in Kolfulu on the outskirts of Yaoundé. The start of the last official requiem honors here at the National Social Insurance Fund Hospital Mutuary in Yaoundé for one of the fewest cabinet level members to have died on duty in Cameroon. The mortal remains of the late minister delegate to the Minister of External Relations for Cooperation with the Islamic World is wrapped with national colors with a few mortuary civilities in strict compliance with COVID-19 government-imposed guidelines. The corpse of the 67-year-old Adam Gargum is later taken to Chinga Islamic Complex here in Yaoundé, where the soul is handed to Allah in this last prayer. A select group of mourners is joined by the director of the civil cabinet of the presidency of the republic, Samuel Vondoayulu, the representative of the president of the republic, Paul Bia, at the funeral. Other mourners include cabinet colleagues, diplomats, and his larger spiritual family, the Muslim family, before the remains, is taken to the outskirts of Yaoundé on the road to Soa for a strict burial. The president's representative, Samuel Mvondo Ayolo, accompanies Adum Gargum to his final resting place after serving the state in several capacities, including 23 years non-stop as minister delegate to the Minister of External Relations in charge of cooperation with the Islamic world. May his soul rest in peace. And on to another sad note, the Banjin community in Yaoundé has expressed its heartfelt compassion and sympathy to the Minister in Charge of Special Duties at the Presidency of the Republic, Philip Mbargamboa. The delegation headed by Honorable Abel Quinche went condoling with the bereaved on the demise of his wife, Madeleine Mekongo Mbargamboa. Kilian Dandifon was amongst the mourners and now reports for the 730 News. The COVID-19 context imposed barrier measures, but it did not prevent the Banjun community in Yaoundé from an African value of solidarity. And that is how they came on reserve to condole with Minister Philip Mbalgamboa, whose wife, Madeleine Mekongo Mbalgamboa, passed on on Sunday, March 28. The Banjun community met with hospitality at the home of the bereaved, a glass of water to share, followed by a prayer session for the host family as well as for the soul of the departed. Then 
the condolence message. We have come to pray for the peaceful repose of our mother Madeleine. We also came to console the family on this sad event. It has touched you and it has touched the Banjun community. You are not alone. You have always stood by us. All our ceremonies, sad or joyful, you have stood by us. The Banjun community will always stand by you. It was a condolence visit, full of symbolism, friendship, peace and tranquility, regeneration and blessings, appreciated by the family head, Professor Laurent Serge Etundingwa. And now on to COVID-19 news, as government hammers on the scrupulous respect of health prescriptions to stall the coronavirus pandemic, there is an increased sensitization on the management of asymptomatic cases. The Ministry of Public Health must follow specific protocols and remain quarantined. Alice Mbei caught up with some medical doctors who find out how safe this is. Several members from this family have been victims of the COVID-19 pandemic and they chose to treat themselves with natural products. I took erythromycin, chloroquine, amoxiclav, vitamin C and zinc. My husband took Cleda's treatment and my daughter took Artemisia from Madagascar. We also took steam baths, ginger tea and after the treatment the tests came back negative. Health personnel say it is possible to cater for COVID-19 patients at home depending on their level of contamination. There are different stages of COVID-19 patients. We have symptomatic cases and complicated cases. Complicated cases are transported to the hospital while symptomatic cases can be handled at home. Measures to avoid contaminating others include wearing of face masks, frequent washing of hands and respect of barrier measures. Medics say patients have been followed up through phone calls and, in case of any complications, patients are rushed to the hospital by the medical team. The transport sector is considered a veritable ground for the spread of the COVID-19 virus as people from different places commute to diverse destinations. This is compounded by seating provisions today flaunted in public transport with cases of overloading quite rampant. Mukwele Prince Will Aduma reports that government's order on preventive measures is almost a near formality. A stopover at bus stations in Yaoundé presenting a semblance of respect of barrier measures. COVID-19 influencing procedures at agencies. Before paying it's very more wise, half your, your face mask, because you have used, you have told us most half, you must throw your face mask to have it. Because if you don't wear a face mask on the road, even the, the military people will disturb you on the road. But off-camera behaviors reveal that much is required to ward off the danger. While on the way, some passengers decide to remove their face mask. The other day, the police ordered one of them out of the bus as a result of that. We trade unions are not involved by the government in this sensitization. The virus does not travel the country. It is commuted. And here, the yellow cars. We tell them to put their mask. They don't want to put their mask. So I don't know what is going on. What will I do? I'm telling them to put on their mask because it's very important. This issue is serious. They are joking. And you, sir? I have it in my back. In your back? Yes. What about your passengers? <laughs> I, I don't know if they have. I think that we trade union have to be called by the <laughs> ministers so that all of our comrades should see that we and the ministers are discussing about this issue. Perhaps the way to go. Otherwise, the virus thrives in transportation. I urge you once again to put on your face masks, to wash your hands regularly, and to consult a physician or any other health personnel if you notice any symptoms. This is the only way to save lives and to curb the spread of the virus. exactly 7.50 p.m. and we'll take you to the Public Health Emergency Operations Center. Physical distancing helps limit the spread of COVID-19 as it requires keeping a distance of at least one meter from each other. It also involves avoiding spending time in crowded places or groups. 
Given that the spread happens when an infected person coughs, sneezes or talks, releasing droplets into the air, social distancing is thus strategic in rolling back the virus. Baldwin Sama and his guest, Dr. Frank Amabu, expound on the importance of this physical distancing. Hello, Baldwin. Tell us more about the necessity to keep physical distancing. Good evening, Esther Kima. It was among the different outline barrier measures by the government last year when we had the outbreak of COVID-19. The Prime Minister, head of government, has laid a lot of emphasis on uh, this particular gathering of a persons or no gathering of more than 50 persons in uh, in Cameroon as far as the spread of COVID-19 is concerned. How can that relate with the spread of the virus? Widely a lot of emphasis on this. Let's find out from an epidemiologist, Dr. Frank Amabo. He is our guest tonight. Good evening, sir. Good evening, doctor. Good evening, Baldwin. Why a lot of emphasis on a no gathering of a more than 50 persons as with regards to how the virus spreads in Cameroon? So thank you, Baldwin, for that question. Thank you for this platform. I think uh, three things come to mind when I think of that. The first is that this is a strong message from the Prime Minister, Head of Government, reminding us that COVID-19, unfortunately, is still present in Cameroon. We still have cases and transmission is persistent. And as you mentioned, this is an, a prescription that dates from March of 2020, reminding us of the importance to limit the number of persons found in a room where the conditions of uh, aeration are not, might not be optimal. The main objective of keeping people under 50 within the room is to understand that the government understands the importance of social interaction, but it wants absolutely that persons while doing that can keep safe and cut the chain of transmission. So this is done so that despite the social interactions that would occur and that are necessary in a human organization, it's important that we give ourselves the opportunity to have a physical distancing by maintaining less than 50 persons within this gathering. Of course, these persons have to distance, but also wear their masks to reduce the risk of transmission when in a ceremony. Thank you so much, Dr. Frank Amabu, for being a guest uh, this evening. It is true that it becomes difficult to resist uh, some invitations these days, but if you have to honor an invitation, make sure you find yourself in an environment where there is a respect of uh, a, not, a gathering of uh, not more than 50 persons so as to adhere to government instructions. Back to you, Esther Kima. Thanks very much, Baldwin Sama. There is no doubt in about the fact that fighting the coronavirus pandemic is a communal responsibility. Now on to our investigative report tonight. We pitch on the phenomenon of assault perpetrated by commercial motorcycle riders. It is commonplace to find citizens stranded on roadsides after hit and rob robbery and sometimes injuries sustained. Do these unscrupulous and dangerous riders belong to syndicates at all? And how can they be apprehended? Cynthia Saptala went finding out and now attempts answers. Based on the accounts of victims, it occurs during a moment of distraction. Some motor taxi drivers or thieves posing as one will snatch the bags of passers-by or passengers in vehicles, sometimes in crowded areas, fleeing with all their valuables. I saw another bike coming, like as if it was coming behind us. It kept following us. Meanwhile, the guy that was carrying me was a direct uh, complice to the guy that was behind me. So the other bike came, then one man sent his hand, pushed me as I was about falling, the other one seized my back and ran. And from other stories recounted, they seem to diversify their methods, often operating in pairs and sometimes with the complicity of other drivers. How then does one board a motor taxi in all serenity? The leaders of this group say they do have rules that apply to members. The real issue is a vast majority of those exercising this profession do not belong to this group. Here at the VG roundabout, about 13 motor taxi drivers belong to our syndicate, but there were more than 100 drivers here. And according to forces of law and order, in most cases of snatching, the culprits often come from another neighborhood. Yeah, we try to identify those who don't belong to this neighborhood. Once there is snatching going on, two or three drivers of the syndicates who have seen it follow him. We have given us 
such culprits to the police. We work in collaboration with the head of each group of motor taxi. In order to intervene quickly in such instances, security forces add that they have teams at strategic areas of the town ready to work, but with the assistance of the population. But many city dwellers suggest that applying stricter rules to regulate the motor taxi sector may be better. And to news from Parliament, the Speaker of the National Assembly, the Right Honourable Kawe Gijibru, has granted audience to the Saudi Arabian Ambassador to Cameroon, His Excellency Abdilala Mohamed al Shebai. Both officials reviewed the flourishing economic and cultural ties between both nations, as well as parliamentary relations. Charles Ebune has details of their exchange today in Yaoundé. Saudi Arabia is one of the countries Cameroon entertains excellent diplomatic ties and this audience granted the Saudi ambassador extraordinary and plenty potential to Cameroon by the right honorable house speaker Kava Yege Jibril is yet another element to strengthen especially parliamentary diplomacy between Yaoundé and Riyadh. Mm -hmm. We try to now to do uh, a lot of meeting with uh, a lot of ministers to push our relationship to Cameroon and uh, Saudi Arabia to more higher. For plus and R, uh, the Saudi diplomat Abdelham Al Shaibi and the House Speaker, the Right Honorable Kavai Yege Jibril, explored possibilities of parliamentary exchange visits, amongst others. The Saudis are involved in several development projects in Cameroon including the construction of the Just Technical High School in Douala to the tune of roughly 14 billion CFA francs. Servants in the North region have had a chance to tell their complaints directly to the Minister of Public Service and Administrative Reforms who spent a working visit to the region. Joseph Lee provided answers to questions about the integration of some civil servants into the public service, transfer concerns, and how certain allowances that these state workers have to battle with every day. With the digitalization of the administrative procedures, the minister reassured them that their problems will be a thing of the past. Wilson Mengole tells us more. The meeting between Minister Joseph Lay of Public Service and Administrative Reforms, regional delegates and other stakeholders in the North region was to listen to the concerns of civil servants ranging from integration into the public service, transfer decisions, chasing of files from one ministerial department to another, housing allowances and a host of others. Our main objective now is to simplify and dematerialize procedures, administrative procedures. We also came to see how we can extend the oral parts of administrative exams, not only in the regional headquarters, but, and why not, in the divisional headquarters of our country. With these assurance, civil servants in the North region hope the issue of traveling to Yaoundé and chasing of fives will be laid to rest. In other reforms, the Azuri Cooperative Credit Union Limited is planning on going digital to meet the increasing demands of its members. It will step up the number of automated teller machines in all its branches and is targeting 3,000 new members in 2021. Karin Tosam tells us more. Aziri Cooperative Credit Union Limited, Azikul, currently has close to 50,000 members across Cameroon. Some of the union's members say they have had life-changing experiences. For me especially, I want to tell you that without Aziri, I wouldn't have been living. I traveled to India for treatment. It's Aziri that gave me, they financed my treatment. My children go to school, it's Aziri. Each time I have some difficulties, I rush to Aziri. Very easy, eh? just with 500 francs you obtain your loan from us. I was uh, in other banks, they were not able to give me uh, a particular sum of uh, loan. So when I came to Aziku, they were able to give me the amount I wanted. The growth in membership has been attributed to the sustained efforts of the cooperative's officials to build trust with its members. We must protect the money members keep with us. So at any point in time that a member has come to withdraw their money, we are able to give it back to them. Them. Just with that, the confidence in our members has become so high. The Aziri Cooperative Credit Union Limited talks of plans to be at the cutting edge in 
in Cameroon's microfinance sector. Gone are those days where members will come and queue up in the offices just to withdraw maybe 10,000 francs. We want to put more ATMs even at petrol points. We are able to put down a strategy like the, and like the micro loans we will be able to give to members without, without necessarily borrowing ASIQ has 12 branches across Cameroon and offers services like finance for startups, keeps valuable documents of its members, gives out business loans and pays salaries of workers in the public and private sector. ASIQ has been awarded by the Confederation of Anglophone Journalists of Cameroon as the best microfinance in poverty alleviation in times of crisis in the country. Officials of the cooperative say they are working on creating branches in all parts of the country. And that advertorial ends this edition of the 730 News, in which you mainly heard that the president of the Chamber of Agriculture, Martin Paul Minjos Momeni, has taken office and he has been challenged to trigger change in the institution and to render it a veritable tool for development and economic growth. Bonus comes up at 8.30 p.m. with Adam Bala. I'll be back tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. God willing, stay tuned to CRTV and CRTV News and stay protected from the coronavirus for it continues ravaging us. I urge you once again to put on your face masks to wash your hands regularly and to consult a physician or any other health personnel if you notice any symptoms. This is the only way to save lives and to curb the spread of the virus. Ici, toute l'info.